We're going to be uh, continuing our series in the book of Mark. And um, we see that after Jesus had crossed over the Sea of Galilee from the Gentile region and the Gerasenes over back to the Jewish side of the, of the lake, there were crowds of people that were waiting for him there. And while he was teaching, there were desperate people. We had a man whose little girl was sick, and he'd asked Jesus to come to his house to pray for her healing. And, and Jesus agreed to do this, and on the way, there was a lady that was ill from uh, a, a malady that she'd been suffering with her whole life, and she touched Jesus, and Jesus healed her. And as it turned, the little girl passed away. But Jesus, being the resurrection and the life, went over to that house and he touched that little girl and she came back to life. So that's the setting as we move into the next section of Mark in Mark chapter 6, um, verses 1 to 5. I'm going to be talking a little bit this morning about the nature of unbelief. Now, if you remember, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in the little stable in Bethlehem, but his hometown was Nazareth. And I turn your attention back to an earlier time when Jesus first started his ministry, after he was baptized by John the Baptist. He immediately went back to his hometown and he began to teach in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And while he was there, he read from the scroll of Isaiah chapter 61, and he said this, he said, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. And when he told the people in the synagogue in Nazareth, that that prophecy was fulfilled in him. They marveled at his words and asked, is this not Joseph's son? As he continued to teach, he was straightforward about what he had to say and who he was, and they wouldn't accept it, and they took him straight over to a cliff, and it intended to throw him off of a cliff. But it wasn't his time, so he just passed through them, passed by them, and they weren't able to accomplish what they were thinking on doing. That was his first um, ministry in his hometown of Nazareth. Now, fast forward now to now, having been shunned at the start of his ministry. Many things had been happening, many things had happened, and certain, certainly word had got out about all the teaching and the miracles that he'd been performing throughout the region of Galilee. Nazareth was part of the region, but Jesus had been ministering all over Galilee and across the, the Sea of Galilee into the Gentile region. And after raising Jairus' daughter, Tabitha, from the dead, Jesus made this decision to go back to the town where they were going to throw him off the cliff, the town where he was raised. So he and his disciples turned towards Nazareth and went to Nazareth. And this is where we pick up on our text this morning. Reading from verse 1 in chapter 6, Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many people who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles that he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor 
except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. So from the narrative of our text this morning, we see that Jesus and his disciples went to Nazareth. Now, Jesus grew up in Nazareth. He was schooled in Nazareth. He took his apprenticeship under his father in Nazareth. There's not a whole lot of details of what that looked like, but he was a carpenter. According to estimations, in the first century, Nazareth was a tiny, obscure little village uh, with a population of about 400 people. Now, to put that into perspective, if you look down the highway south of us here, there's a little town called Clinton, and I lived there for a little while when I was young. Presently, Clinton has a population of about 641 people. I think that was the last uh, census population. So Nazareth was like about that size of a town. And because of its tiny size, most everyone that lived in Nazareth was familiar with most everyone else that lived there. That's one of the beautiful things and one of the scourges of living in a small town. People know who you are. People know who your family is. They know what you do for a living. They know what your mom and dad did for a living. They know everything, or they think they know everything about you. <laughs> and there's a lot of this going on, right? A lot of that going on. And from the perspective of outsiders, the town of Nazareth didn't exactly have a stellar reputation. If you remember when Jesus was in the midst of choosing his 12 disciples, in John chapter 1, verses 45 to 7, we see the disciple Philip discussing uh, with Nathaniel, discussing with him that Jesus Christ was Jesus of Nazareth. So we see this, and he says, Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. And that was the beginning of Nathaniel becoming part of the Twelve. This town had one synagogue. Jesus started his earthly ministry, read Isaiah 51, or 61 there. They tried to throw him off the cliff, and now here's the second time he returns back to Nazareth. And in the meantime, what had Jesus been doing? In the meantime, Jesus had been fulfilling absolutely everything that he had read in that synagogue the first visit. He had been preaching to the poor. He had been healing the brokenhearted. He had been preaching deliverance to captives. He had been healing the blind in all manner of sickness, and he even raised a synagogue leader's little girl from the dead. But here we see, after when Jesus went to his hometown the second time, he went back into this synagogue and he began to teach on the Sabbath as he had done the first time when all that had happened. People in the synagogue, it says here, they were amazed, amazed at his teachings. And they would have observed the crowds of people, not only as disciples this time, but I'm sure there were throngs of people that had followed him up from the Sea of Galilee up to Nazareth. And so there was crowds and crowds of people with Jesus following him into his hometown. They couldn't put it together. Here was the son of Joseph the carpenter whom they knew so well, or so they thought. He was performing miracles and teaching with wisdom. He was not trained in school to be a rabbi. He was trained to work with his hands as a carpenter. He was never the formal disciple of a rabbi, must, much less a prominent rabbi. Where did all this stuff come from? How could this Jesus, who they knew growing up in their community, be promoting all of these teachings? And there's a man named Philip Brooks who says it best, I think. Familiarity breeds contempt only 
with contemptible things or with contemptible people. The citizens of Nazareth, they were familiar with Jesus being the son of Joseph, the carpenter. They were familiar with his family and they knew his mom. Brothers, sisters, knew all of them. <laughs> because they knew Jesus before he started his anointed ministry under the power of the Spirit of God. They couldn't possibly believe that this little Jesus they knew growing up could be the Messiah. So they doubted. They doubted what they saw. They doubted what they heard. I think their, their spirits were filled with pride and contempt, probably over their own positions in life. And you know how it's like in small towns. Families are always comparing themselves with other families. They thought Jesus could be no better than them. His family was likely not very prominent, powerful, or rich in comparison with maybe the wealthy ones in that town. We don't know what happened to Joseph. There's no mention of him in the later part of the Gospels. It's very likely that he had passed away from some accident, possibly, or a disease. We don't know. The Bible doesn't speak to it. But even with Mary and Joseph, think about this. It would have been a very difficult thing for them to explain what happened to the, fam to the family and also everyone else in the community, what happened with the birth of Jesus their firstborn son, right? The story of the virgin birth would have been too fantastic for many of them to believe, so they must have assumed that Mary and Joseph probably had sexual relations before marriage and got pregnant and they had a shotgun wedding. They probably did. So after all, Mary... She was pregnant out of wedlock. I think they assumed Jesus was the product of sin. And we see this reflected later in Jesus' ministries. The scribes and the Pharisees poked at that issue. Who is your father, they said. You know, we are not illegitimate children. Huh, you are. That was the insinuation they made. And this was all the subject of gossip in the town. But as far as what was happening here, they could not see past their own inaccurate biases. They assumed Jesus couldn't be an anointed spokesperson for God, so they refused to believe, and they actually showed contempt. That's a heavy word, contempt for him. And we see all along that these scribes, Pharisees, and I'm sure a lot of these people that were showing contempt for Christ attributed, attributed his miraculous healings and the works that he did as coming from the devil rather than coming from God. So here we see that Jesus Christ was amazed at their lack of faith. Just as I guess you could say he was amazed under certain circumstances of Gentiles who displayed extraordinary faith. And one of the themes central to this gospel of Mark is the unbelief of people who came into contact with God's servant. Jesus accepted the fact that a prophet is never accepted in his hometown. and I can see that, but it must have hurt him to see the rejection from his own family members, extended family in Nazareth, and the friends that he'd grown up with. We're told that the people of his hometown were amazed at his teachings and works. They knew that something was extraordinary about him, but they wouldn't believe. And throughout Galilee, Jesus was met by crowds of people desiring to be healed or even just to touch him. And he was gladly received by the multitudes. And here in his hometown, they were so apathetic to this. Why would Jesus be amazed at their unbelief? He'd done so many things to prove that he was the Messiah. I mean, certainly people from Nazareth were talking to others that were telling about all these miracles that he had done down near the sea. Jesus said, the works that I do, they testify of me. 
And later he said to his disciples, believe me or else believe me for the works, my works sake. You know, Charles Darwin once said that belief was the most complete of all distinctions between men and lower animals. Now, as creationists who believe in the creative hand of work done by the everlasting God, we don't subscribe to the theory that man evolved from animals. But there is distinction between the animal kingdom and people. And one of the distinctions, I think you could say, that Darwin had was true. The ability to have faith and to believe is one of the major distinctions between humanity and the animal kingdom. But if you think about that for a moment, on the flip side of that observation, it would also strongly suggest that unbelief or lack of faith in the creator on man's part puts him on the same level as animals. And I hope that we take some time to ponder this and ponder also the propensity that we have in the fallen part of our nature to gravitate towards faithlessness and doubt. You know, many of us that are sitting here today, many of us listening to this broadcast on the internet have come from extremely dark circumstances in life. Now, Jesus Christ, if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, he's cleansed you from your past sins, and he's made you new, just like what we are testifying to here today with baptism. You're born again, and there's cleansing that takes place. And many of us here have had profound experiences with the living God when we gave our heart, our spirit, over to Jesus Christ when we surrendered. We've been truly born again. Compared to where we once were, it's like springtime in the spirit. It's beautiful. I'm not saying it's always going to be easy, but there's a difference, a marked difference. Think back. If you came to Christ in a, out of a bad circumstance, think back to the way it used to be, and now think about what God is doing right now and what he's done in your life. Amazing. Amazing love. How can it be? Wow. Others have been born into good Christian families. We've seen the work of the living God through our parents. Our parents, not perfect in any way, but we've seen a real tangible difference between the way we've been raised and the darkness and the brokenness that is outside of the church in this cold, dark world. Yet, like spoiled rich kids that complain about things when they have all the toys and food and housing that others could only dream about, sometimes it's our propensity to doubt the goodness and power of God and to take all that we've received for granted. You see, it's the part of us, the nature of Adam. When you come born again, there is a new nature, but you still have this fallen nature that rides alongside. And there's this propensity sometimes to fall into doubt. And at times our inability to trust Jesus when he has done so much to show us who he is, it must amaze him, don't you think, sometimes? I think when God sees my life, he's probably amazed. Wow, Clint, after all I've done, to see you acting this way, thinking this way. You know, son, we need to get back on track here. Doubting is part of the human experience. Even the disciples that's, that walk with Jesus struggled with doubt. There's a solemn warning and admonition in Hebrews chapter 3.12, which states this. He says, See to you, brothers and sisters... Speaking to Christians, see to you, brothers and sisters, see to it 
that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Lack of faith is a very large contributing factor in hindering the work of God. Unbelief, like what we see here in Nazareth, has some immense consequences. Under the circumstances, it, it permits evil to flourish and closes the channels of grace and mercy that God desires to pour out. And as a result, only a trickle gets through to human lives in need when it could be a rushing torrent of deliverance. The same lack of faith that hindered the work of God amongst the people of Nazareth can hinder our walk with Christ today. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to open up a little bit of the chapter of my life. I don't often use illustrations about my own life. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what happened to me as part of my testimony. When I was four years old, my mom and dad, who had just become Christians, they were on fire for God. They were saved from their life of darkness and came to the Lord and they were serving him. And I, I remember at four years of age, giving my heart to Jesus on my mother's knee. But when I was a young boy, there was a period of time, a number of months. And mom, you're listening to this too, I know. You remember this. When I was about five or six years old, I think, I'm not, I think it was five years old. I came down with a disease. And that particular disease took away my ability to walk. My condition persisted over a number of months. My parents were taking me to the doctors and they were trying to figure out what was going on. There was a suspicion that I had come down with polio or some other terrible neurological disease. I can still remember as a little guy when I couldn't walk, sitting at the kitchen table where my parents or my mom had put me. And I can remember looking at my feet and thinking, if only I could just walk. I was very young, but I knew that I was in trouble. I was looking at my feet and I would push myself away from the chair only to have my knees buckle and collapse into a heap on the floor. They didn't know what was wrong. My parents were besides themselves. If you've ever had a sick child, you know how that feels. My mom and dad were very concerned. Well, it was several months, and they are in the throes of discovering what was going on with me. And mom and dad were so concerned. I can remember, I can still remember this. It's just like, like you guys are standing here. Mom and dad were in my bedroom, and I was laying in bed, and they, they came, and they, they got on their knees, and they laid hands on me, and they began to pray. God, have mercy on our little boy. God, have mercy on our son. We'd really appreciate it if you would heal him. Jesus, we know that you can do it. So we just give this over to you, Lord. I'm not sure exactly all the words that they said or how they prayed, but I remember them laying hands on me and praying for me. I want you to know something. After they prayed for me, it was like I could feel the power of God come into my body. And I felt the strength come into my limbs. I actually felt it just like wash over me. And I'm like, Mom and Dad, I've been, God has touched me. I think I can walk. And I jumped out of bed and I began to walk around and I began to run around. I was miraculously healed as a little boy through the prayer and the grace of God through my parents' prayers. <laughs> this is part of my heritage. When my dad was like, well, let's test this out, he said. So he can remember me getting on my back. And he says, put your, leg, put your feet up on my chest and then push me as hard as you can. And I launched him backwards. I, I launched him backwards. I can remember this. 
And past that time, when I was a little guy, I decided that I wanted to run. And boy, did I run. I began to run, and I, I ran everywhere. I, I loved running. I loved the freedom of feeling the strength in my legs and being able to run. And I ran, and I ran, and I ran, and I, I ran, and I was fast. I was fast. I won every track meet that I went into. As a young boy going, going through school, it became very apparent that I was gifted with this, and I pursued athletics. And I can remember, um, it just became something. My parents would take me to different places and go to different track meets, and I got involved in provincial athletics. And it was when I was 16 years old, I um, had just got back from the juvenile nationals with a gold and a silver medal. And um, I was training one day, and uh, I twisted my ankle and blew my ankle. It was all blue and swollen and everything. It was all bunged up. And I needed to, I had got crutches and I was hobbling around on these crutches. And hey, to a sick teenager, 16 years old, there's this tent, tent revival meeting going on in the area. And I heard that these pe friends of mine and their families had been going to this revival meeting and that there were certain people that were getting healed. So. I thought, well, God healed me when I was a little guy. <laughs> Why wouldn't he heal me now? I went and I went to this meeting and I went up for prayer afterwards and guess what? God healed me again. I left that tent meeting on, I, I went into the tent meeting on crutches and I left the tent meeting running. I was jumping up and down thinking, yes, this is what God wants me to do in my life. He wants me to pursue this, and my, had, my dreams were to go to the Olympics and all this stuff, and I was well on the way for that. But um, along the way, I began to get arrogant. And I, I remember that whole next year, I, I got arrogant. I started to think that uh, my identity was in my athletics. And uh, I drew self-worth, and I got printed in the newspaper and got to speak to different people and all that, and it got to my head. I freely admit that. Um, I ended up getting a full scholarship to the University of New Mexico for my graduating year, where I was going to go and pursue my dreams. And it became an awful lot about me. I began to, I was drifting in my faith. I was doing stuff that I shouldn't have been doing. And it was all, God, this is what you want for me. But it was me projecting that. Forgetting that the mercy of God was the whole reason why I was there. And I got injured again the, the year before I grad, like the summer before I graduated. And for my athletic scholarship to continue, I need to produce times and distances and that sort of thing to the university to keep my scholarship. I got injured really bad. I tore my quadricep muscles and uh, on my right leg. And then I proceeded to pull my hamstring as well when I started healing from that. And it was just, I was a mess. Couldn't produce any times. I lost everything. I lost everything. My scholarship went down the toilet. I couldn't produce any times or anything like that. And I can still remember shaking my fist at God and saying, how could you do this? You're so good, aren't you? You dangle a nice little carrot in front of your servant, and then you pull it out of their way just because... It's all fun and games, hey? I go, oh, I was mad. I was mad. I totally turned my back on everything. I started to party and got into the wrong crowd and all this stuff. I broke my parents' heart during that time. But you see, I was in a position of doubt. I doubt... When you are a little boy 
five years old and your parents pray for you and you can't walk and you jump out of bed, that should stick with you, wouldn't you think? And then to show how much he loved me, again, he did this miracle. But this is all part of the package. You see, God wanted me to understand something, that it wasn't about me. And he had to, he had to break me. He had to break me and bring me to my lowest point before I would look and see what a sinful thing I was doing. And even in the midst of all this goodness and the things that he was doing, I wasn't living for him. I was living for myself and his name and saying, this is what you want for me, right, God? And I was projecting that. But I, I was living this lie. I was living for myself and for my own self-interest. I was really concerned with the things of this world, not the things of Christ. And God broke me. I was very much broken. I became angry and bitter through, I just started living wrong. But thankfully, my parents never gave up. They prayed for me. And the night I was going to leave home for Vancouver, my dad sat me down and he called me in and he said, son, you're just like Satan. I remember that rattling me. I was like, what? How could you say that? He says, no, you listen. You knew the truth. God poured his Holy Spirit out upon you. He did all these wonderful things. He healed you. He did all these things. My mother tried it in. Don't you remember this? And begin to bring up the faithfulness of God and the Ebenezers that were set up as landmarks in my life and my heart felt empty and I melted. I melted. And by the end of that night, I was weeping before God and I repented came back to the Lord. Amen. (sighs) Doubt. You think that would be the end, eh? The end of the doubts? No. I live my life, and there's times in my life, even as an adult, that I would sink into this. Things would happen, and I would be, like, disillusioned and stuff. Like, really? Mm. Like, what's wrong with you? I'll tell you what's wrong with me. It's that old nature. The Bible says, submit yourselves and walk in the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. You have to keep in step with the spirit. God calls us to do that. And maybe there's someone here today where you're disillusioned because something didn't go the way that you thought it should. You thought you should be doing this, doing that, going here, going there. And God has said no. And he's closed the door. And maybe it took an injury to get you to settle down and sit down and pay attention. And maybe God's still working with you in your life right now. You're not realizing the dreams that you had and that you thought were yours. And that God wanted for you. But in fact, those dreams were your own projections of what you thought was best. See, I look back now and I think, oh my goodness, Lord. I wouldn't be married to this beautiful woman that I'm married to now if I hadn't been diverted from that path. I wouldn't have the family and the wonderful boys and my daughter that I have now. I wouldn't be pastoring in this wonderful church with all you wonderful people right now. And I'm so thankful to God for each and every one of you. And you wouldn't be here either. You see, God diverts us sometimes through pain so that we let go and we let him. You see, in the scriptures here, we have the Nazareth scenario where all these people that grew up with Jesus, they saw the power of God displayed before them and they wouldn't listen. Why? Because it didn't make sense. It wasn't in their thinking process that God could actually work this out. They thought Jesus was the product of sin and there was no way that he was the Messiah. So their doubt robbed them of the opportunity to come to know Christ in all his power and become one of his disciples, and they were lost. And in the midst of all that, we have Judas, who is one of the 12 
that walked and he saw Jesus raise, or raise Lazarus from the dead. He saw Jesus multiply. We're going to talk about the loaves and the fishes soon here, the miracle of the loaves and the fish. He saw all of this stuff. He saw Jesus say, be still, and the whole sea was calm. He saw all of that. The demon-possessed guy delivered, blind eyes opened, on and on and on. What you think he would learn? You think he would, it would sink into his thick skull. But no, he let the sin nature dominate his thinking. And he didn't trust Jesus the way that he could have if he would have surrendered. <sighs> My friends, today, God is calling the sin nature in James 4, 2 to 3 say this, says this, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. I didn't kill a person to get what I wanted, but I did kill my testimony and my reputation as a young man. I quarreled and I fought. I became a blight on the reputation of the local church that I was a part of, and I broke my parents' heart. This is all because of my disobedient and rebellious heart. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? A terrible sinner sees the power of God at work and turns away. Remember the 12. Judas. There was Judas who betrayed the Lord with a kiss after seeing all that he did. But let's not stop there. Let's look at Peter. Peter denied Jesus Christ three times when he was being led away to be crucified. Look at Thomas. He wouldn't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead unless he could actually see and touch the nail holes and the spear hole in his side. And just as Jesus was amazed at the unbelief of the people in his hometown, I'm sure that it's amazing at the unbelief that he can witness amongst even his disciples. Now, in the case of many, those in Nazareth and Judas, they walked away from the truth of the Savior, and ultimately they were lost. They never came to know Jesus truly. But it didn't have to go that way. They didn't yield to the Holy Spirit who was working through Jesus in his ministry. Remember when he was baptized, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Jesus moved in the power of the Spirit as an example to us. Peter and Thomas, however, they recognized their sin. And they recognized of their wayward behavior, and they repented. They turned around and they cast themselves before God and said, forgive me. That's what they did. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. That's what he said. They came to Jesus for restoration and forgiveness to get back on the right track, and he did not turn them away. After all of the wrestling with their doubts, and myself, I speak. I was wayward despite all the good things that God had done in my family and in my life, but I came eventually to submit to the Lordship of Christ, repented and was restored. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe you're here. You're struggling. Jesus is calling you to let go of your doubts and believe. Maybe you've 
you've been picturing the love and the grace and the things that you've seen in God through your life here as a believer. And you've been at the cusp of just turning away, even though he's done great miracles. My friend, today if you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit calling to you to submit your way of doing things and yield to his plan, do not delay in coming back to him. Come back to the Lord. Cast yourself before him and let him lead your life once again. That story of the prodigal is so true on so many levels with so many folks. Hebrews 3, 7 and 8 says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion in the day of testing in the wilderness. You've been grafted into God's tree of salvation. You are a child of God, and the scripture applies to you. Don't harden your heart like those Nazareth people, or like Judas, or like the Pharisees, or the scribes. But today, if you hear his voice right now, repent. Come to the Lord. Cast your cares upon him. Cast your anxieties upon him. Let go of those things that you can't control, that you've tried to control for so long, and tried to make work in your own strength for so long. Come unto the Lord, all you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and he will give you rest. All of us are sinners, and all of us at times, we falter. God has given us his grace, and it's grace not only for salvation, but grace for continued strength as we walk through our lives. God is not finished with you, he wants you to grow spiritually. He wants you to surrender the things that you've held back on him. Surrender and let the Spirit of God draw you back. 1 John 1, 8 and 9, I'll close with this. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's God's promise for you today. Come back to the shepherd of your soul. Only God knows where your heart is. But the Spirit of God calls out surrender. Amen.